Welcome to the Live Big Podcast, where real estate expert Nick Paynes shows you that everyone can build wealth through real estate investing. Nick and his featured guests will give you the tools, resources, and expert information you need to leverage real estate into a wealth building strategy. So you can stop worrying about your nine to five and start to live big. Here's Nick with today's episode. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Live Big Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Paines, and today we are going to be talking about how to get that wealth building journey started, um, that first home purchase, and um, how we evaluate when somebody comes in with the forward-facing plan to uh, to build that wealth. So what that conversation looks like and, and what we talk about. So we'll get right into it and um, we'll talk a little bit about how you start by buying your first house and how we look at it from a financial aspect and, uh, and that wealth building aspect. So um, I wanna start with a supporting point today and uh, the kind of a statistic, it's a, it's a kind of a staggering stat, but, um, and we've mentioned this in previous podcasts, but um, this is the actual statistic here. So according to the St. Louis Federal Reserve, the average homeowner's net worth is $255,000. The average renter's net worth is $6,300. So that means that the average homeowner has over 40 times the net worth as a renter. Uh, again, just a kind of a mind blowing statistic there. And um, I, I think there may have been a, a, a time where I said in a previous episode, in one of the early episodes that it was like nine times or something like that. And actually I thought that's, that's previously, I thought that's what it was. Um, and I remember reading that, but that was many years ago. Um, this, this article or this uh, statistic from the St. Louis Federal Reserve is actually very up to date. It's within the last, uh, it's with it in 2023. So um, kind of a crazy housing stats to, to start with. And so um, hopefully that is a, a piece of of data right there that shows why it's so important to start this uh, journey of home ownership and and building wealth through real estate. So um, the second key point is that home ownership rates, this is this is really going back to about 1965, but home ownership rates have fluctuated between 63 and 68 um, percent, meaning that's the percentage of homeowners versus renters. So we're always somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 30, that, that's 37 to 32 or 32 to 37 percent uh, renters. OK, it's not a significant change. So if you look at this kind of fluctuation over time, over like a 60 year period, it's not a very volatile graph. Right. And, and so we end up with these increases, uh, home ownership increases um, during low interest rate environments. And then those tend to fall off as we get into higher interest rate environments, uh, because obviously affordability goes down. Sometimes with those higher interest rate uh, environments, we see um, property values decrease, uh, which gives people more of an opportunity to purchase. But again, most people are looking at their monthly payment when it comes down to purchasing a property and not the overall cost of the home. And, and those higher interest rates are significantly uh, more, uh, they, they, they make a much more significant change in the monthly payment than the actual cost of the home. Okay. And that's why a 30 year mortgage is so powerful, by the way, is that, that the leverage is what makes something affordable or not. Okay. It, it, it has nothing to do with the overall number. Um, in fact, when mortgage rates were in the two and three per, high two percents, and, and actually we, we saw people as low as like two and a quarter. Um, but it almost wasn't a thing to own a million dollar home at the time. Um, just because a, a million dollars leveraged over 30 years at two and a half percent, um, isn't that crazy? Uh, it's it's not that big of a it's not that big of a monthly payment compared to what it is at five or six or seven percent, and so um, people were buying million dollar properties like crazy, and it's why we saw uh, home values jump so high is because people could afford it. People could afford a six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar home with uh, uh, such low interest rates. So. Um, that rate environment that we talk about is really what guides 
again, affordability. And so <clears throat> when it comes to buying your first home, right? And when you're, when you're starting this, whether it's a wealth building journey or just like the, whatever the American dream to own a home, the reality is, is most people have some sort of desire or, or dream to own their own home, right? And, and we look at that, that, that can be for financial purposes, that could be for emotional purposes, that could be for security, um, it just depends. I know there's a lot of people that uh, they just get sick of moving from, from rental to rental as, as you know, landlords decide they wanna sell. Uh, that can be a big piece of it. I know people that prefer to rent. Um, that's okay. I, you know, people that, that don't want to maintain the property on their own, they don't want to be responsible for those, you know, for the, the things that come up in the home. Um, and then there are some instances, especially in, in different locations in the United States, where it actually makes sense uh, to rent. If you're only going to be living somewhere for a couple of years, it might make sense to rent. If you're living in an area where there's very high taxes, um, but the rents don't reflect that, uh, sometimes buying a home and having a huge property tax or having a huge insurance payment uh, can be detrimental and, and not be as affordable as, as finding a rental. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, if someone, for example, let's say in Colorado has owned a home since the 1980s, they probably bought that home for, you know, somewhere in the, depending on where it is, somewhere between 10 and $50,000. Um, and so they may have a very small mortgage on it, their monthly payment, or they may have it completely paid off. So when they go to charge rent, they may only charge 1500 or 1800 bucks a month because to them, it's all, all cash flow. So even if the the property calls for a higher rent rate, they're kind of okay with it. And it's one of the traps that we talk about as far as, you know, one of the traps that landlords fall in and it's not keeping up with market rent. When you don't keep up with market rent as a landlord, it, get, it makes your exit strategy very difficult, right? So if you're trying to sell a property that's significantly under rented, you either A, need to wait for that tenant to move out before you can sell the property um, and then fix it up or whatever, because also something that's under under rented is usually under kept um, and has tons of deferred maintenance, right? Because a landlord who is charging say 50% of market rent is a lot less likely to make changes or updates or update bathrooms or you know keep up with that deferred maintenance and a tenant who is paying $1,000 under market rent is a lot less likely to ask for those things because they don't wanna rock the boat, right? As soon as they ask for those things, that's when the landlord comes in and says, well, if I do those things, I'm going to have to raise rent. And then they start backtracking and go, oh, well, you know, never mind. So those properties, that is the pitfall that a lot of landlords end up in is they're, signif they're charging significantly under market rent, okay? And which means that the property is going to be unkept. And so when the when they go to sell, they've lost a tremendous amount of equity if they don't put the work in to bring the property back to, to today's standards. Um, and they've lost a significant amount of cash flow over the time that, uh, that, that they've rented the property for less than market value. So um, it's really it, it's really important a as a, as a landlord not to fall into that trap um, but you know the when we're evaluating our situation as to whether we should buy or sell it's important to understand that um, a, a landlord that's charging 50 percent of market rent it, the, all they're doing to that person all they're doing to that renter is actually enabling them um, to stay in a property and when they do end up, having to sell the property or when they do end up having to move that renter out, it puts that renter in a really bad spot because maybe they're used to paying $1,500 per month for rent. And then all of a sudden they get out into the, into the kind of the quote unquote real world of what real estate's actually doing. And they've been living to their means paying $1,500 per month. Now all of a sudden in order to buy a house, they're gonna have to pay three grand a month. Or even if they wanna rent again, they're gonna be $2,800 a month and all of a sudden it makes it really difficult. So, you know, you can look at it whatever way you want, but I, I believe in empowering people and, and not enabling people. And, and the, and the problem is, is we maybe don't even know we're doing it and, and, um, renters may not see the benefit of it, but if you're not sticking with current market rents, you're, you're doing a detriment to, I think, both parties. Um, and, and the other thing is, is if you, as a landlord, if you're not increasing your rent and improving the home as you go, then like I said, 
your your tenants are not living in a nice place. And I think it's important to have your tenants living in a place that they can appreciate and something that they can feel like they can call their own. So, um, so anyway, to, to get back to the, the kind of the first time home buyer, the starting your wealth journey, what we're looking at is, is once we get past the point that we, once we get past the point that we are looking at, uh, we don't want to look at the property as an investment when we're first starting our, our, you know, Hey, we're going to, we're going to buy something. We want to look at it as the place we're going to live. So you're going out to buy your first property, find something that you're going to enjoy because you're going to live there at least a couple of years, I'm sure. And so, uh, do, you know, buy something that you're going to enjoy and, and inevitably it's going to become a great investment real estate and, and just property in general is going to be a great investment. It's your hedge against inflation. Um, and if the, you know, the United States, if the, if the inflation numbers that we've seen recently, um, the, the, you know, consumerism and the amount of spending that goes on recently um, is any tell and the amount of debt that we have is any tell about how things will continue to move in the future. We know that, owning land, owning property, owning commodities, owning, you know, tangible things, um, and, uh, and commodities is going to be valuable. So, um, when you're buying that first property, buy it because it's something that you like, right? And if it's something that you like, it, it, it ultimately will probably be something that someone else likes as well. And we'll, we'll ultimately turn into and make a great rental when the time comes. Um, if you're moving, if you have this mentality, I know a handful of people, I know, actually, I know a lot of people that have this mentality right off the bat that they're like, I'm doing this for investment purposes only. I don't care where I live as long as I know I can turn it into an investment. Um, if you have that mentality, I think that's great because it can put you really ahead of the game. I mean, there are opportunities to buy for example, quadplexes um, with as little as a three and a half percent down payment, you can use an FHA loan to buy a quadplex and then you can rent the other three units and live in one and you only need a minimal down payment. So you could go out right now and buy a million dollar quadplex for $35,000 out of pocket and the three rents for the other the other three properties would come close, probably not in Colorado's market right now, wouldn't pay the entire mortgage, but you would be living at a discount for one. And then when you went and turned that property and, and, and moved, you would now have a, you know, a cash flowing property on an FHA loan uh, with a very minimal down payment. And again, if we look back at those appreciation numbers and look at 5% appreciation, you got a million dollar property that's appreciating $50,000 per year um, when, your, when your original investment was only 35 grand. So you've got well over a hundred percent annualized return to do something like that. Now, in order to do that, you have to be okay with, um, you know, living in a, living in a quadplex, uh, you know, for your first year of your first couple of years or something like that. So, um, you know, if you've got a family that might be difficult, but you know, if you're single and you're looking to, you know, grow some, grow a real estate portfolio, that's a great way to do it. Buy a duplex, a triplex, a quadplex, do it on an FHA loan with a minimal down payment. Okay. Um, so, so those are your two ways to look at it. Like I care where I live and I want to enjoy where I live, or I don't care as long as it's building me wealth. That's like the first question I'm going to ask you when we're looking at this kind of investment journey. The second question I'm going to ask is why you're doing, why you want to do this? Why do you want to own real estate? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Are you trying to build like a tremendous amount of wealth? Are you trying to build a cash flow portfolio? Um, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Are you trying to replace your job, um, you know, and, and have a passive income that surpasses the amount that you make on a monthly basis through your job? All of these things are really important because we're trying to figure out what we're investing in and where we're investing. And in Colorado, like I said, right now in the current rate environment that we're in, Colorado, for example, is not a great cash flow market. So if you come to me and you go, Nick, I need immediate cash flow, I'm probably going to tell you that Colorado is not the place to do it. Are there cash flow markets? available? Absolutely. Um, all throughout the United States, there's cash flow markets available, but I think it's a very short-sighted thing. And, and so um, I, I'm, I will always express that, that depending on your age, um, you know, you shouldn't be worried about cash flow right up front. We should be worried about acquiring assets and building the net worth. And then ultimately that can turn in to the cash flow that we need later in life, right? So 
One of the strategies that I teach people for somebody, you know, for people that are really wanting to kind of grow over, let's say, a longer period of time, 10, 20, 30 years, um, I try to teach what, what I call a uh, what I call the exchange up exchange often method. And the idea is, is that you buy your very first property and then you can either exchange that property, like sell it and, and buy two more. Okay, or you can acquire another one, right? And so the the exchange up exchange often means that we're splitting our our assets every single time. So we buy one, turn it into two. Okay, we take those two, we turn it into four, we take those four, we turn it into eight, and we're acquiring assets along the way and we're leveraging them. We're always leveraging those assets because at the at the beginning stages of our investment strategy, we don't really care about the cash flow as much. That's what we have a job for. Okay. By the time you get to 10, 15, let's say 20 properties, okay, as you're exchanging up, okay, then later in life when you want to retire. Then what you do is you take the great state of Colorado that has afforded you significant appreciation, even if it's just 5%, 5% over 20 years times a couple million dollars in properties means you're going to have two, three, four, five million dollars in equity. Now what you can do later in life, if you're trying to tr turn it into a cash flow strategy, is sell all those properties, exchange out of all of those properties, and now you have five million dollars in cash. That $5 million in cash, you can do plenty of different things with if you want cash flow. You can put it in the bond market and make $200,000 a year in bonds. Okay, You know, have capital gains taxes on them, but okay, you're going to have opportunities to do something with that money that, I mean, you could just live off the $5 million. You could put it in a, in a CD and probably live off the interest and in, in just a small amount right, um, of, the, of the actual principal. You can move it out of state. You can take that $5 million and go buy, let's say, go to, uh, I don't know, the, the Midwest somewhere, go to Kansas, go to a, a college town and buy a bunch of townhomes for $100,000, $200,000. I mean, you could buy 25 townhomes um, for two, you know, for, for $200,000 a piece that don't really appreciate much. They're not in an appreciating market, but they're in a great cash flow market, right? So um, for those of you that have maybe done some more uh, homework on investing, one of the things that you'll see um, online and on YouTube videos and things like that is people look for what they call the 1% rule. The 1% rule is that your property should have a monthly rent of 1% of the purchase price. So if you buy a property for $250,000, it should rent for 2,500 per month. Okay, I can tell you in Colorado, that rule is more like the half percent rule. Okay, if you buy something for a half a million dollars, it is rent for somewhere around 2,500. Okay, we don't even come close to the 1% rule. And there's a lot of people online that will tell you, there's a lot of people in YouTube videos that'll tell you if it doesn't pass the 1% rule, don't buy it, okay? That would be for a cash flow model, okay? You're not going to get the same appreciation out of a property that cash flows like that as you will in a higher appreciating state, okay? It's the reason why cash flow numbers and, and cap rates in Colorado, California, Washington, areas like that, New York, okay? It's the reason cap rates are really low. It's the cash flow is very low in those areas, but the return that you get is through appreciation. So you take your early stages of your investing career to build up wealth. If you go buy a bunch of $100,000 properties in Kansas or in Wyoming or something like that, and you hold them for 10 years, after 10 years, those properties are gonna be worth $110,000. Okay. In fact, it won't even have enough appreciation to keep up with the inflation that happened over that period of time. These are low appreciating areas of the United States. They generate great cash flow, but there's no appreciation. So now after 10 years, what do you have to show for all that cash flow? Well, first of all, most people spend that cash flow because it's easily accessible. So they go, oh, look, we're making four grand extra a month. Let's go on vacation. Let's buy cars. Let's buy another, you know, whatever. So let's buy a bunch of depreciating assets. Okay. And after 10 years, you have very little appreciation in your property. Then you have some principal pay down, which is nice. Okay. But you don't have the equity growth that you have in some of the, the bigger appreciation states. So again, go back to Colorado, acquire 10 properties, acquire 20 properties, whatever it may be. 
And then at the end of your kind of career, when you want to retire, when you want to get into passive, exchange those properties out and move into a cash flow state. Okay. That is kind of the method that, that, that we teach that allows people to build a, a, a great amount of wealth at the sacrifice of cash flow when they don't need it. Okay. Um, the problem is, is if you're like, I want cash flow immediately, that's fine, but you need money to do that. Right. So if you don't have cash and I don't know how many people, uh, I don't know a ton of people that have a half a million dollars or a quarter million dollars sitting around. Um, and so we have to buy properties minimally, you know, with minimal down payments and, and leverage them. And if you ask me, you know, would I rather buy a hundred thousand dollar property in Wyoming cash and have all the cash flow? Let's say cash flow is $1,200 per month or $1,500 per month, or put a hundred thousand dollars down on a $500,000 property in Colorado and have zero cash flow. I would take the zero cash flow all day. Okay. Because that property in Wyoming or whatever, like I said, might be cash flowing you 1200 bucks a year or a, or a month. So you're looking at like 14,000 a year. Okay. But my $500,000 property, okay. Not only is going to have principal pay down somewhere in the neighborhood of five to $6,000 per year, but it's going to appreciate 25 to 30 grand a year. So even though my cash flow is zero, my net worth increases by you know, thirty to forty thousand dollars. Where the cash flow property in Wyoming, okay, yeah, I'm cash flowing fourteen thousand, but I get you know a thousand, two thousand dollars of appreciation and no principal pay down because I bought it in cash. So my overall return on the investment is less than half of what it would be if I bought an appreciating state, right? So it's about timing what you're what you're trying to do. So when you're building your when you're starting this wealth building journey, it's like okay try to figure out what it is that you want to do. I get a lot of people that come to me that say, I want to get out of my job maybe in five years or in two years or, or, or whatever it may be. Unless you've got a bunch of cash saved up, you cannot replace a significant income that quickly. This is a long hold strategy, right? I, I think I've talked before about what cash flow numbers might look like in your first year, or your second year, or your third year. It, it takes 10, 15, 20 years to get to a point of significant cash flow. Okay. But in that time, that wealth building journey can be really significant. I mean, you can build your net worth millions of dollars in that same period of time that it takes to get your cash flow from zero to 2,500 bucks a month, which 2,500 bucks a month is not gonna replace your, your full-time job. So really think about what it is that you're trying to accomplish and then we build a plan for that. And so that plan is gonna be, and, and what we do is we work backwards, okay? So we start at what is your end goal, okay? I wanna be worth $5 million, because I know if I'm worth $5 million, I can do X, Y, and Z, okay? So if that's your goal, I wanna be worth $5 million. Then we talk about, okay, where, what, what age are you and how long is it gonna take to get there? just through real estate. And, and again, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of being well diversified. So I don't think real estate should be your only investment. I think you should have your 401k, especially if you have a company match, I think you should have an IRA um, and, and contribute to those things. And you will need those things as you acquire real estate because you'll need reserves. Okay. So lenders are going to look for reserves as you start to buy real estate. And if all your money is in houses, they don't allow that equity to be part of the reserves. There needs to be cash on hand or there needs to be some type of retirement account that can be drawn from um, to, to show that you've got some stability uh, from a from a cash standpoint okay so um, the once you figure out what that number is on the back end you can kind of work backwards from there and go okay in order to do five million I need to have 20 properties with two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in equity okay and you can start figuring that out and going, okay, if I buy a property every year and those properties increase in value on average, if I buy the same price property every year and those properties increase $25,000 in value, you know, per, per year, I know that my first property that I buy in year 20, okay, we're going to have significant or in year one in 20 years, we're going to have significant value. 
But the only way we're going to be able to buy property number two is to leverage off of property number one, right? So we're going to we're going to kind of rob Peter to pay Paul, um, but it's going to allow us to acquire more assets, right? So um, not only are we saving money to buy that second property or that third property, but we can go back and borrow against property number one. So yeah, maybe in five years, property number one has $100,000 in equity, which is great. And it puts us right in line to get to where we need to be with that $5 million, okay? But we can't do it without acquiring property number two. So what do we do? We go back and we borrow that $100,000 from property number one in order to buy number two. Okay, our net worth has stayed exactly the same. Property number one now has zero equity in it, but or whatever, $100,000 less equity in it. But now we have a second property that has $100,000 in equity. So our net worth has stayed the same, but now we have two assets that are appreciating that maybe we have minimal cash flow on and that we have principal pay down. Okay, year three comes around, year four comes around, and now we have more equity in those other properties and we borrow against them again. So again, anytime we borrow against the previous property to buy a new property, it doesn't negatively affect our net worth, okay? It may hurt our cash flow a little bit, okay? It may, um, and, and it's gonna increase our overall debt, but we're going to acquire another asset. So if you can get to the point where you own $5 million worth of assets, even if they're like fully leveraged, right? Even if they're, and, and this, this wouldn't even be possible, but let's take an extreme circumstance and say, you will have them fully leveraged, 100% leveraged $5 million worth of assets, which means you have a, a net worth of zero. If you now just sat on those properties and did nothing else at 5% appreciation per year, you're looking at a quarter of a million dollars per year in appreciation, $250,000 per year in appreciation, right? So you just let that run its course. Every four years, you've got a million bucks. So to get five, to get $5 million, it's going to take 20 years. Okay. And that's just an appreciation. If you were to count principal pay down on that $5 million, principal pay down on $5 million, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 70, $80,000 per year. So now you have 70, 80,000 on top of the 250. Now it's really only going to take you 15, 16 years to accumulate wealth of, of, you know, $5 million um, in net worth. And that's again, not including if you're raising rents during this period and that you're, that you're generating some cash flow. Okay. So what it takes in order to be able to do that is some form of financial discipline, right? In order to be able to buy that second house without selling that first house, it takes that financial discipline that we've talked about in prior episodes, right? Like don't buy at the top of your means, pull back a little bit and say, hey, I know I could get a $600,000 house, but if I buy a $450,000 house, I can keep my first property. Right. And that's what's going to allow you to, to kind of grow exponentially. Right. So we've talked in previous episodes about um, buying your first home. And if we if we sh if we move more towards uh, if we move away, I, I should say, from the investment strategy and just talk about, hey, how do I acquire the, the first property? OK, the first property we've talked about doing down payments as little as three or five percent. But there's even better opportunities out there um, through government assistance programs. We have down payment assistance programs that allow people to purchase properties for as little as $1,000 down, okay? So that is all that's required from the loan standpoint. Now, you're generally gonna have closing costs and things like that, which closing costs at, right now in Colorado, depending on the property, are generally somewhere between five and $8,000. However, depending on the property. Again, a lot of times we can get seller concessions that will help the help the buyer pay for those costs. So I've had multiple clients over the, over the, over the last uh, five years that we've gotten into properties for $1,000. Okay. So think about that. When you're thinking about like, maybe if you feel like you have the inability to buy a property, okay. You have the inability to buy your first home because you can't save enough money. Can you save a thousand dollars? Right. One of the people that I talked to, uh, one of the one of the one of the clients that I talked to many years ago, um, I said, you know, they said that they didn't have any money for a down payment, and I said, you know, do you have a four hundred one k or something like that at, at work that you contribute to? And they said, yeah, I, I contribute like four hundred dollars a month. And I said, do yourself a favor, like 
just don't contribute to that 401k for a couple of months. Take like three months off and take that $400 and put it aside. Now you have, now you have enough money to do a down payment assistance loan to buy, to buy a property. It's pretty incredible that you can buy an asset that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars that will appreciate tens of thousands of dollars per year for as low as a thousand bucks. Um, it's a, it's a really empowering thing from a financial standpoint, especially when you look at the ROI of just that, um, just the appreciation alone on a thousand dollar investment, right? So understanding some of the down payment assistance programs that work out, that work out there to get your kind of journey started and get property number one under your belt. It's so important to know what's out there. Right. It's so important to educate yourself or have somebody educate you about what the ability is to do that. Right. And some people say, you know, one of the things that's that's difficult with down payment assistance is it it tends to leave you with a very high uh, monthly payment. Right. Um, if you're putting very little down, your mortgage amount is significantly higher, which means you're going to have a bigger monthly payment. You're going to have mortgage insurance. Um, all those things are very true. But. If you can, again, make a sacrifice to say, well, you know, for the first year, for the first couple of years, I'm going to have a roommate, right? To help me pay that mortgage, to help me offset those costs, right? I always tell people like, choose your hard, choose your struggle, right? You can, your hard can be trying to make rent payments or trying to figure out how you're going to save for retirement or trying to figure out like, how am I not going to work the rest of my life, right? Or your hard can be, I'm going to share, I'm going to share a house for a couple of years, right? I'm going to rent a room for a couple of years, like choose your heart, choose your struggle because you have the ability to do that. And I strongly believe, first of all, most people have the ability to qualify for more money than they're actually willing to spend, right? So yes, a lot of people have qualifying problems, but I believe the majority it's not about their ability to qualify. It's their, their own personal ability to make that monthly payment, right? And don't get me wrong, I get it. A $3,000 a month you know, payment on a, on a house in comparison to maybe if you're paying two grand a month in rent, it's sometimes unfathomable to think about how am I gonna afford an extra $1,000 per month uh, for housing? Like I already like live paycheck to paycheck, um, you know, paying 2000 in rent. There's no way, even though I can afford it, like even though the, even though the bank says, yeah, from a debt to income standpoint, you can afford it. I get it. Like with inflation and the things that are going on right now, cost of living is super expensive. If you're buying food and you're paying for insurance and you're paying for your cell phone and your car and gas, and all, I get it. I understand completely how you can make a very decent income, 60, 70, 80, even $100,000 a year and live paycheck to paycheck on a $2,000 per month rent. I understand that. So my point would be, can you say, you know what? The bank will give me a loan to do it but I can't afford 3000. So how do I afford it? Well, can I rent one of my rooms, right? Do I have a friend that would come live with me? Am I willing to share my house, have somebody pay a thousand dollars a month for, for one of the rooms so that I can offset that increase from the rent that I'm paying, right? To the mortgage that I'm paying. And the sacrifice is, is you don't get to live alone anymore. You don't, if that's what you want to do, you, that you have to have a roommate, but the gain that you get is what we talked about at the beginning of this episode, which is you get 40 times the net worth that a renter has by acquiring just that, really just that first property, right? So yeah, you're paying three grand a month, but a thousand of it's being offset by the roommate. So all else is equal from the monthly, monthly payment standpoint. But now all of a sudden you've got, you know, 10, 15, 20, $30,000 per year in equity growth um, and principal pay down. Your money is going towards something versus, versus that rent, okay? So understand, educate yourself, know that there are programs out there to help people get into their 
to their first home um, with very little money down. So if cash is the issue for you, if having money on hand is the issue for you and not so much your qualifying power, um, we can make it work. There are things that we can do to, to help you. And there's, and these programs exist all over the United States. It's not just here in, in Colorado. So educate yourself on those and find a way to get into a property. Um, I might, uh, I might pull in one of my prior clients for, for a future episode, but offhand, I know of three or four right now um, that use down payment assistance. We got them seller concessions and are in their house for a thousand dollars. Um, and I'd love to hear maybe one of their stories now looking back three or four years or five years, um, on, you know, if they have any regrets <laughs> getting into those properties for a thousand bucks versus continuing to pay rent. So, um, so anyway, I hope that's a good overview, a good understanding of kind of that, that, that initial start to building your wealth. And, and again, it could just be buying your first home, which is how can we do that with a very minimal down payment, maybe with a down payment assistance program, or how can we start your wealth building journey? Let's talk about what the end goal is and work backwards from there. And let's start with that single step, right? Like you, you, you have to take that first step forward to get yourself that far down the road. So, um, those are, those are kind of the main points. Those are the things that I want to bring to light, uh, for you today. And, and I hope that those have been impactful for you to realize that this is something that I can do. And if you already own a home, if you already own two or three homes, we still do the same process with you. So we'll bring you in, figure out financially where you want to be and talk to you about how you can get there through real estate. So um, that's it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to another episode and uh, hope that you'll continue to uh, uh, check out our future episodes. Go back and listen to some of the ones that you may have missed uh, in, in, uh, in prior weeks. Um, and check us out every Wednesday. Check us out online at www.blackgettygroup.com. For our resources, um, check our metahomes, uh, metahomesco.com uh, page for our real estate page. And um, let me know if you have any questions uh, or any thoughts or any uh, things you'd like me to cover in future, future episodes. So thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, make it a great day. Go out, live big. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Live Big Podcast. For even more real estate and investment resources, go to blackyetigroup.com slash resources and download Nick's complete guide to running your own rental properties. Tune back in next week for another episode. And until then, live big. Live Big does not provide investment, legal, or tax advice, and nothing herein should be construed as being financial, legal, tax, or other advice. Live Big does not represent that any securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. No investment or other decision should be made solely based on the contents or information found on the website or podcast. When making a decision about your investments, you should seek the advice of a professional financial advisor or qualified expert.